by the American Institute of CPAs on the act of... You're listening to bostonfreeradio.com. Hello and welcome to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke, and Words on Film is a show to which you are listening on bostonfreeradio.com, watching and listening on Somerville Community Access Television or some community television station somewhere in the nation, which I am very thankful that the, sh the station you're watching is Pick My Show Up. Thank you very much. Or you are watching and listening to me on Facebook Live, either on my own personal page or on Boston Free Radio's personal Facebook page. Either way you could join me, I'm glad you could join me to discuss my favorite topic, which is movies. Now, I usually have five movies to review for you for this show that just came out or came very close to coming out last week. Well, basically, I mainly review new movies for the show. This show, however, is somewhat of a special show because I am reviewing five old movies. But these five movies have one thing in common. They are my all-time favorite movies. So I'll explain more how I came up with the list in the next segment. But for this segment, it is titled, What's Topping the Box Office? These are the top ten highest grocers this past weekend. Last week, the number one movie at the box office was It. This week, number one box office... The number one movie at the box office is It. The movie grossed a, a very impressive $60.1 million this weekend on a budget of $35 million, so it grossed nearly twice its budget this past weekend. But what's really impressive about It is that on a budget of $35 million, it is so far in just two weeks grossed $218.8 million, and that's just in the United States. Around the world, it has grossed $372.3 million, making it a certified hit here in the States and around the world, and I wouldn't be surprised if it grossed a billion dollars by the end of the year, but again, we'll have to see if that happens. American Assassin is the number one highest grossing debut movie of the week, but overall it's the number two highest grossing movie of the week, having grossed $14.8 million. Against a budget of $33 million, it has grossed $14.8 million here in the States and $21 million worldwide. So it's off to actually a pretty good start, especially considering that there weren't many other new movies that have opened up this weekend, but it's not a hit yet here in the States or around the world. Mother, the latest movie directed by Darren Aronofsky and starring Jennifer Lawrence, is number three at the box office this weekend the second highest grossing debut movie of the week, having grossed $7.5 million in the United States against a pretty hefty budget of $30 million. Around the world, it has so far grossed $13.5 million, which means it is neither a hit here in the States or around the world, at least not technically, but it might be in the coming weeks. We'll have to see. Home Again was number two at the box office last week when it debuted. This week, it is number four, so it dropped two spots to number four, having grossed $5.2 million this weekend. And I think if you add the numbers of the weekend box office grosses of every movie besides it, it would probably equal or maybe even be less than how much it grossed this weekend. But anyway, getting back to home again. Against a budget of $15 million, which is actually quite light considering that Reese Witherspoon is in the movie, Home Again has so far grossed $17 million in the United States and $19 million worldwide, meaning that it's a tentative hit here in the States and around the world. The Hitman's Bodyguard, if you can believe it, has been out in theaters for five weeks. This week it drops from number three at the box office to number five, having grossed just $3.6 million here in the States this past weekend. Against a budget of $30 million, The Hitman's Bodyguard has so far grossed $70.4 million here in the States and $141.4 million worldwide, making it a certified hit here in the States and around the world. Wind River hasn't debuted as strongly as The Hitman's Bodyguard, but this is a movie that people are talking about. I should know because I've talked with the common man about how good this movie is. I can't believe I'm saying the common man, but basically, the people I've spoken to love this movie, and I think you're going to hear a lot more about this come Oscar season. But 
Wind River dropped slightly from number five last week to number six this week, having made this past weekend $2.6 million. Against a budget of just $11 million, Wind River has so far made $29.1 million here in the States and $34.8 million around the world, which for a movie with as slow a start as Wind River's had is very impressive. It is a certified hit here in the States and around the world. Annabelle Creation, I'm not going to waste any time on this one. I'm just going to tell you it's a certified hit here in the States and around the world, as it has been at least for the last four weeks. But Annabelle Creation just made $2.4 million this weekend, but against a budget of $15 million, that's $1.5 million, Annabelle Creation has made $99.7 million here in the States and $291.1 million worldwide. Even though I wasn't the biggest fan of Annabelle Creation, there were some fans out there, and I totally respect them for their movie-going decisions. Number eight at the box office is a movie we know here in the States as Leap. Everywhere else around the world is known as Ballerina. It's number eight at the box office this weekend, sliding from number six last week, having made $2.2 million. Against a budget of $30 million, Leap, also known as Ballerina, has so far made $18.7 million here in the States, which means it's not a hit yet here in the States, but it may eke its way to being a tentative hit probably in about two or three weeks given the numbers it's pulled in this weekend but around the world it has made 100 million dollars making it a certified hit mainly because ballerina first opened in france and canada and a number of other countries before it hit theaters in the united states but not a hit here in the states but it more than makes up for its worldwide gross making it a certified hit worldwide Spider-Man Homecoming is number nine at the box office this weekend, dropping from number seven last week, having made $1.9 million this past weekend. Against a budget of $175 million, Spider-Man Homecoming has so far made 861.2, excuse me, 330.2 million here in the States and $861.2 million worldwide, making it a certified hit here in the States and around the world. And finally, Dunkirk, number 10 at the box office, sliding from number eight, having made one. $1.3 million here in the States this past weekend. Against $100 million budget, it has made $185.1 million here in the States. My name is Lola Silvestri, and I'm going to be 95 this year. I was very independent. I fell, and I had to have meals on wheels. America, let's do lunch. One in six seniors faces the threat of hunger, and millions more live in isolation. Drop off a hot meal and say a quick hello. Volunteer for Meals on Wheels by donating your lunch break at americaletsdolunch.org. This message brought to you by Meals on Wheels America and the Ad Council. Making Waves with Boston's All-Italian Language Program, featuring Italian pop, rock, and folk music from yesterday and today. Amici ascoltatori, vi aspettiamo ogni sabato dalle 11 a mezzogiorno qui su mabostonfreeradio.com con musica italiana di ieri e oggi. Buon ascolto. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. And as I said previously before beginning my What's Topping the Box Office segment, this is a show where I'm actually not going to be reviewing the newest films. There are a couple of reasons for that. The primary reason is I didn't have very much time to see any new movies this weekend, if you can believe it. It was a very, very busy week, and I did have a personal tragedy in my family that occupied a lot of my time. That's the first reason. The second reason is not a lot of new films have come out. I did tell you last week that I will be reviewing Mother and I will might be reviewing American Assassin, but I didn't get a chance to see those movies, mainly because of my family crisis, but don't cry for me. Everything's okay. It was just that family that family tragedy occupied a lot of my time. But instead of canceling my show outright or basically just spending the rest of the show twiddling my thumbs, which would be very boring for the people who are listening to me on the radio, I decided to make this a special show and make it about my all-time favorite movies. A lot of times when I tell people I'm a movie critic and I host a show about movies, everyone asks me the same question. 
what is my favorite movie? And I tell them the same thing. I don't exactly know. I've seen so many great movies throughout my lifetime, and I can never name one movie that stands out above the rest. And I, I always feel kind of bad about that, but at the same time, it shows you that I genuinely love a lot of films. So what I usually tell people is I narrow it down to my top five, and that's what I'm doing for you for this show. So I'm going to begin by reviewing my first all-time favorite movie. And again, this isn't in any particular order. It's, it's very much in random order, because I still don't know what my number one favorite movie is. But I'll start with a movie that I always reference first, and that is the movie M. M is a movie that is a German film that came out in 1931. Did it come out when the Nazis occupied Germany? No. The, um, that happened in 1933. But a, f a few years after the Nazis took over Germany and Adolf Hitler became Fuhrer, M was probably not surprisingly banned in Germany, but it wasn't the only country that banned this movie. The significance of the movie M, and that's M as in mother, or in this case, M as in murder, the significance of M is it is reputed to be the very first movie about a serial killer. I'm not sure if that's true, but in many sources that I've read, M deals with a very dark topic that very few movies, especially not in the United States, ever dealt with. I think now there are quite a few movies about serial killers, especially made-for-TV movies, so it's still shocking, but it's not nearly as taboo as it was in the 30s. And there are a lot of taboos that the movie M breaks. It's directed by Fritz Lang, who had a very respectable movie career before this, having directed a number of silent films, including most notably Metropolis, which is a great early science fiction film if you ever get the chance to see that on DVD, although I recommend going to an art house cinema and seeing that on the big screen. It is quite incredible what Fritz Lang was able to do with that film when he first came out with it and when talkies literally did not exist. So when Talkies debuted in 1927, most notably with The Jazz Singer, which wasn't the first film to have sound, but it was one of the first. It was one of the very first to incorporate speech into movies. It hadn't been done before The Jazz Singer. But when m movies like The Jazz Singer came out with sound, m silent films were basically done. And a lot of silent film makers and silent film stars went away with them, but not Fritz Lang. And as a matter of fact, Fritz Lang did something very interesting here. Yes, this is a movie that has sound, but there are various moments of eerie silence in this movie that Fritz Lang unabashedly put into this film when a lot of people were using sound in their movies as a novelty. But Fritz Lang knew that eventually the novelty of sound would wear off. Now it's not so much a novelty of films as much as it is a necessity. But anyway, about the story. The story is not only about a serial killer, it is about a very disturbed psychopathic serial killer who targets young girls. Remember, this is 1931. So if it's an unpleasant topic now, it was very taboo when it came out. And the murderer in this case is Hans Beckert, who's played by Peter Lorre in one of his greatest performances. So the deal with this serial killer is that not only are girls being murdered left and right, and presumably, although not explicitly stated, sexually molested, but because of this, the police are having a very hard time finding him, so the criminals from the underworld of Berlin, where this movie takes place, seek out to find this murderer for two reasons. One, even the most hardened serial, uh, even the most hardened criminals in this world frown upon people who murder and presumably molest children. And two, because the police in this film are on the lookout for this child murderer, they're also honing in on other underworld activities. So the movie comes to a head when, without revealing too much, the criminals actually find Peter Lorre's character, Hans Beckert, and bring him to justice. And the scene where they actually stage, I, I, I feel really awful 
revealing certain secrets. I tr this is I consider a spoiler-free zone. So when I reveal spoilers, I try not to. Well, I try not to reveal spoilers, but if I am so inclined to reveal spoilers, I always give you a heads up. But so here's a spoiler alert. He does get caught by the criminals, but that's not what makes the movie significant. What makes the movie significant is it has incredible set design, one of the eeriest performances in the history of movies that probably rivals even serial killers and monsters that come out in movies to this day. Peter Lorre does fantastically here as somebody who's at first very scary and then comes off as somebody who's very pathetic, but also somebody who's psychopathic by the psychological, psychological textbook definition of psychopathy in that he's unable to function in society. So that patheticness to him makes his character even more intriguing, which is why M is one of my all-time favorite films. The average time a resume spends on an HR manager's desk is seven seconds, and most of them are tossed aside. Now imagine if one of those resumes belonged to Yasmin, who was... Living in a shelter, juggling three jobs. I had to be resilient. That's something that you can't teach. We rely so much on a resume, yet it could never tell the full story of someone who... Had to be independent and take initiative, and that's how I handle every project I get. Discover new ways to develop great talent at gradsoflife.org. Brought to you by Grads of Life and the Ad Council. Greetings, Earthlings. This is Funkatron 5000, the intergalactic space robot. Whenever I cross through the Milky Way, I make sure to tune into Crushed Velvet Soul on bostonfreeradio.com. 5 p.m. to 6 p.m. every Monday. It's the place I go to get on down and get funky. I think you will too. Welcome back to Words on Film. The spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures to which you are listening on Boston Free Radio, watching on Scat V or some community access station that's been kind enough to pick this show up. Thank you very much. Or you are watching and listening to me on Facebook Live, either on my own personal page or on Boston Free Radio's Facebook page. Either way you could join me, I'm glad you could join me to discuss my favorite topic, which is movies. And in this special edition of Words on Film, I'm giving you my top five favorite movies of all time. Before the break, I revealed one of my favorite movies being M from 1931, directed by Fritz Lang and starring Peter Lorre. The next film, which is one of my all-time favorites, is The Bridge on the River Kwai, which came out in 1957 and was directed by David Lean. And even though David Lean is known today for his, for directing such epics as Lawrence of Arabia and Dr. Zhivago, amongst others, Bridge on the River Kwai was actually his very first epic film. Now, not only is this rated on IMDb as the 138th best movie of all time, but it also won seven Academy Awards for Best Picture in 1958, Best Actor in a Leading Role, Alec Guinness, Best Director, David Lean, as I said, Best Writing, Best Adapted Screenplay, I should say, by Pierre Boulet, Carl Foreman, and Michael Wilson, Best Cinematography, Best Film Editing, and Best Music, Best Original Score. It was also nominated for Best Actor in a Supporting Role for Sesu Hayakawa, but he actually did not win. But winning seven out of eight Academy Awards for which you're nominated, that is really good. But don't let the Oscar nominees or wins make you think that I'm just choosing this because it won so many Academy Awards. That's not true. I'm choosing this one because it is a great movie and w probably one of the most unique war movies ever made. It, you don't see a lot in terms of battle here. You see some, and it's usually at the very end during the, the climax when you actually see the bridge that's over the River Kwai. But it's unique in the sense that it chooses various perspectives in this war epic. And the main plot of the movie is, after settling his differences with a Japanese POW camp commander, a British colonel cooperates to oversee his men's construction of a whale railway bridge for their captors, while oblivious to a plan by the Allies to destroy it. So the movie takes place in a 
Japanese POW camp, as I said, and there are British and American soldiers who are held prisoner in the POW camp. The primary colonel in the POW camp is Colonel Nicholson, who's played here in a nearly career-defining performance by Sir Alec Guinness. And Alec Guinness has had plenty of other iconic roles, but this one probably has not overshadowed his role as Obi-Wan Kenobi in Star Wars. But that was more of an ending career performance. It's still iconic, but anyone who's a fan of Star Wars should certainly see Bridge on the River Kwai if they haven't already to get a sense of what made Alec Guinness so special besides having the right role in the right place at the right time in 1976-77 later. So anyway, Colonel Nicholson is still in command of his POW troops in this Japanese POW camp, even though he is held prisoner along with these other soldiers. So they still, they still get into formation whenever the, the head colonel Saito, who's played by Sesu Hayakawa, in an Academy Award-nominated performance, is summoning them. They still take commands from their Colonel Nicholson, and that's not so much a testament to the discipline of the armed services, even though there is that, as much as these soldiers trying to maintain their sanity while being in this Japanese POW camp. Now, being a movie of 1957, Bridge on the River Kwai did not delve into how hard it was to be in work labor in these POW camps. To get a sense of actually how hard it was for World War II veterans, a movie to check out would be Unbroken, which was directed by Angelina Jolie and stars Jack O'Connell. That is an underrated World War II film, but it came out well after World War II. But anyway, but for a movie of its time, Bridge on the River Kwai is certainly great in the sense that it focuses in on these POW soldiers, how they maintain their sanity, how the Colonel, especially Colonel Nicholson, played by Alec Guinness, is still able to be in command, and also how he uses his command to influence other soldiers under his command to finally build this bridge. Not to mention the fact that, much to the silent chagrin of Cor Colonel Saito, Colonel Nicholson actually has experience in building bridges. So there is talk in the film about Colonel Nicholson potentially engaging in treason by helping these Japanese soldiers build this bridge across this river. Is it treason? It actually isn't because Colonel Nicholson makes a point in the film to note that as a prisoner of war in a, a, under the Japanese, he is required to take orders from the people who are holding him prisoner. But eventually he focuses so much on building this bridge that he doesn't realize the horrors of aiding the Japanese prisoners, or rather the, the Japanese soldiers who were keeping him prisoner. And there's also an interesting dynamic between Colonel Nicholson, again played by Alec Guinness, and Colonel Saito, played by Sesu Hayakawa, in the sense that there is one prison guard, basically, Colonel Saito, who actually doesn't know very much about building bridges and has to rely on the, the other colonel with whom he has taken prisoner. And there's also a great backstory behind Colonel Saito. Surely he is... Surely he is dedicated to the Japanese cause of winning World War II, which they ultimately lose, but that's another story. But he's also highly educated in London, which is how he was able to speak English. And th I don't have very much else to say about this movie because I have 10 seconds left, but Bridge on the River Kwai is indeed one of my all-time favorite movies because it is so multi-layered and very well acted. Everybody buckle up. Ba -ba -ba -ba. Buckle up. Let's go. Buckle up. Can you go to the store? Come on. Buckle up. Ice cream. Everybody. Everybody. 
buckle up. A lot goes on in the car, but you're in control. So only move when you hear the click that says they're buckled in. Never give up until they buckle up. Learn more at safercar.gov slash kidsbuckleup. A message from the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration and the Ad Council. Hi, I'm Pierce. And I'm Calvin. And are you tired of fake news? Yes. So tired. Sorry, were you asking me? I was just in general. Oh, well, I'm, yeah, yeah. I'm, I can only speak for me. I'm really tired of so, fake news. Yeah, me too. So, good thing is we run... Uh, oh, that's right. Radio we, show. Right. We have a radio show where we uh, try to debunk fake news. We try to cut through all the all the oh, crap. The crap. Yeah. Because there's a lot of it. Uh-huh. And we're trying to bring you f straight facts. Straight facts. Oh, it's called Fact Up. It's Our show's called Fact Up. It's not called Straight Facts. facts. No. The show is called Fact Up. Up. And it's Mondays at 2 p.m. And it's an hour long. Yeah, only on BFR. <coughs> Boston Free Radio. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. And continuing on with my special show of what my all-time favorite movies are. Just to recap, t uh, two breaks ago, I was telling you that my favorite movie, one of my favorite movies was M, directed by Fritz Lang and starring Peter Lorre. Then, my second favorite movie or rather my other favorite movie, I'm not doing it sequentially or in any kind of particular order, is Bridge on the River Kwai, directed by David Lean and starring Sir Alec Guinness and William Holden and other people. The other movie that is one of my all-time favorites, which I'm revealing for the first time both to radio listeners and to the people who are watching me, is Do the Right Thing, the movie that came out in July of 1989 and sparked quite a bit of controversy when it first came out. And today it is a modern classic. It was directed by, written by, and starring Spike Lee. And it was the film that really put him on the map. It was the... It was his breakthrough joint, for lack of a better term. And it's a movie that takes place on the hottest day of the year on a street in Bedford Stuyvesant, in the Bedford Stuyvesant section of Brooklyn, also known as bed -Stuy. And it's when everyone's hate and bigotry smolders and builds until it explodes into violence. And this is a movie that deals with a lot of racial issues, not just white against black or black against white, although there is that. But it centers on the owner of a pizzeria in bed -Stuy named Sal, who's played in a career-defining performance, and I don't mean that in the cliche sense, by Danny Aiello, a, a role for which he... Danny Aiello received, I believe, his only no Oscar nomination to date. But it's a great performance by Danny Aiello. It's a role that ultimately was going to go to Robert De Niro, but Robert De Niro had to, had to drop out because of a scheduling conflict. But Danny Aiello could arguably be considered the lead actor in this movie, but he was actually nominated for Best Supporting Actor in this movie. And he's a guy who means well, but he also has to deal with his racist son, Pino, who's played by John Turturro, and his other son, Vito, who is not as racist but doesn't help things, who's played by Richard Edson. And there's also a young black man who works for them as a delivery boy. His name is Mookie, and he's played by the film's writer and director, Spike Lee. So this is a movie that has many performances, many roles, and a lot of tension going on beneath the surface. But what's great about a lot of these roles is you can't really exactly tell who's doing right and who's doing wrong in this movie, except perhaps the most well-natured characters, Demare, who's played by Ozzie Davis, and his longtime crush, Mother Sister, who's played by Ruby D. And there, uh, I'm getting some Facebook comments here right now. Yes, there is also Radio Rahim, who serves as, I wouldn't exactly say a Greek chorus. The real Greek chorus in this movie is... Mr. Senior Love Daddy, who's played by a then not quite as well known, but still as dynamic, Samuel L. Jackson. But Radio Rahim is the guy who carries his boombox around, constantly playing the song Fight the Power. And it goes to show you how far the the Oscars have come. Yes, this movie was nominated for two Oscars, one for Danny Aiello for Best Supporting Actor, but the other one for Best Original Screenplay, neither of which this movie 
was nominated, but I would argue that Fight the Power is probably one of the most iconic songs in a movie in the year 1989. That's coming from a year that brought us one of the most iconic Disney films of all time, The Little Mermaid, which I think was nominated for at least two Oscars for Best Original Song, and ended up winning one, I think for Under the Sea. But Fight the Power is a, mo is, a, is a song that is confrontational, and very much like the movie Do the Right Thing, it definitely makes you think about racial relationships and how they have evolved and not necessarily for the better. And Do the Right Thing came out at a time when a lot of white America began to think that after the civil rights era, that racism was essentially over. And Spike Lee was arguably one of the first filmmakers, definitely one of the first African-American filmmakers to say that no, Racism is still alive and well, and probably even more complicated than it was in the 50s and 60s. And it takes a lot of characters in this film and a lot of situations in this movie to hammer home that fact. In addition to that, there are some scenes that I, speaking as a white man, I didn't quite understand the significance of them or the motivations of certain black characters. And it took me a while and multiple viewings to understand why certain characters reacted a certain way. And again, spoiler alert coming up, one of the scenes that I, I have to admit that I did not understand was when, or at least when I first saw it, was when Mookie, played by Spike Lee, throws a trash can into Sal's Pizzeria and ends up starting a riot. Why he did that, I didn't quite understand that, but I did read a review by Roger Ebert where he regarded Do the Right Thing, rightly so, as one of his great movies. And Roger Ebert actually asked Spike Lee directly, why was it that Mookie of all characters was to have thrown that trash can into Sal's Pizzeria, especially since Sal and his family didn't do anything particularly wrong to him. Spike Lee's response was, no person of color has ever asked me that question. It's, it's an audacious statement, and certainly from somebody like Spike Lee, it, it, you have to take it with a grain of salt. But it is one that makes you think, and that's what Do the Right Thing has done for me every time I've seen it. There are parts in this movie that are screamingly funny, and there are uh, other confrontational parts that make everyone think. And I, I come back to it, and I regard it as one of my favorite movies of all time, because even with all its grim moments and the parts that really make you rethink your race and your take on people of other races it's a movie that feels alive and when you're regardless of what temperature you're watching it in whether it's in an air-conditioned building or outside you feel the heat of this film which is why do the right thing is one of my all-time favorite films Welcome back to The Dog Show. Up next, we have Satchmo. Satchmo is a member of the Shelter Pet Group. That's right, a group known especially for their couch snuggling, ball chasing, face licking, and of course, companionship. Now, let's see him in action. Look how he makes eye contact with his person. That's actually known as the treat stare. How intuitive, and now he appears to be excitedly turning in circles. Ah, the happy dance will come in with this group. But really, the best way to know an amazing shelter pet like Satchmo is to meet one. Visit the shelterpetproject.org today. Adopt. Brought to you by Maddie's Fund, the Humane Society of the United States, and the Ad Council. From the hub of the solar system to the world, bostonfreeradio.com.
Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. And thank you so much for tuning in to this special edition where I reveal my, all, my top five all-time favorite movies. So I'm making it a point, uh, usually when I'm reviewing movies and I post the live feeds on my Facebook account, I always list what movies I'm about to review. But I'm not doing that this time because I want my favorite movies in particular to be a surprise. So just to recap, my first, uh, I'm reviewing these in no particular order, so I don't really have, it, it's not like I'm counting up to my number one favorite movie of all time. I really love these films almost equally, and I can't exactly say which one is my favorite movie above all the rest. But just to recap, first I reviewed M, starring Peter Lorre and directed by Fritz Lang. Then I reviewed Bridge on the River Kwai, directed by David Lean and starring Sir Alec Guinness. Then I reviewed Do the Right Thing, which was directed by Spike Lee, written by Spike Lee, starring Spike Lee. Also, Danny Aiello, John Turturro, Roger Genvier Smith, Bill Nunn, and many other fine actors. Now, my next favorite movie of all time is one that's not nearly as controversial as the other ones, but it is still a great movie. And I will tell you my reasons before, well, in a little bit. But that movie is Who Framed Roger Rabbit. Now, Who Framed Roger Rabbit is significant for, another, for a number of reasons to me. One, it is the second film I ever saw in a movie theater. The first one was Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. And also, it's a movie that, through repeat viewings, I've probably seen it about 25 to 30 times, not exaggerating, it still holds up. It is not just a movie that plays with the novelty of live-action characters interacting with animated characters in a real-life setting. And Who Framed Roger Rabbit was not the first film to do that. However, it was the first film to do it flawlessly as it was, and also had a greater message, whether it meant to put it in or not, about segregation. And that's just one of the reasons I love Who Framed Roger Rabbit. But the other reason this movie is not only my favorite, but it's also a great movie, is there is no one I know in this world who I've met so far who doesn't like this movie. And I, I even know people who don't especially like cartoons or don't have the affinity or appreciation for them that I do, but they love this movie just the same. And I think a lot of that has to do with maybe the allegory of segregation, but it also mainly has to do with how great the characters are. Even the, the 2D characters, they may literally be 2D by being animated, but they are just dynamic, round characters. There's a lot to Roger Rabbit, a lot more than the, the gags he pulls or the refrigerator landing on his head and, and birds forming around his head because of that. There's a lot more to him. And actually, his primary trait, being a beloved cartoon character, ends up being his weakness once he's framed for a murder he didn't commit, and his life is literally at risk and there is a ma main conflict in this film in that normally cartoon characters when you see them and it doesn't matter who they are whether it's mickey mouse bugs bunny or whomever they cannot die except in this universe by this really disgusting looking ooze and there's one scene that even the most even some people who have who have stomachs for such gruesome scenes can't take, and it's where the primary antagonist of this film, Judge Doom, played wickedly and so well by Christopher Lloyd, actually takes an adorable-looking shoe, uh, who's anthropomorphic in the sense that he has eyes and he can talk, but he takes the shoe and he dips it into this, this ooze, ultimately killing it. And you, you, you see the, the shoe when it's being dipped into the ooze, but you don't actually see it completely disintegrate. But when Judge Doom actually lifts his glove out of the ooze and there's red on it, it's, it's a really hard scene to watch. But this movie is also, it, it takes a lot of inspiration from great films that have come before it. 
even some that ha haven't really appealed to kids, like Roman Polanski's Chinatown. But it takes those elements of those previous films, not to mention the appreciation of the short films of the 30s and 40s, which which movie houses were required to show before films. And man, I wish movie houses had that rule again, but that, that's another story for another time. But it takes those appreciations and certain influences from previous films, both short and long, particularly from the 30s and 40s, and not only pays homage to them, but also creates a really good story, not to mention an interesting buddy cop comedy. And Bob Hoskins does especially well here playing the immortal Eddie Valiant, even though Bob Hoskins is sadly no longer with us. In fact, he was so great as Eddie Valiant that I didn't realize that Bob Hoskins is actually British, not a guy from New York, until years after this film came out. In fact, I think it was, I saw him in, in the movie Michael with John Travolta, and I thought to myself, why does he have a British accent? Why is he doing that voice? He doesn't need to. Why doesn't he just speak the way he did in Who Framed Roger Rabbit? But that was a little bit before the internet was as efficient as it is now and long before smartphones, and I could just look up that he was born in England. But that's another story for another time. But Who Framed Roger Rabbit works, especially amongst, amongst virtually anybody. And as I said before, I know people who don't especially like cartoons, even some people who hate cartoons, who love this movie. And it's amazing how ambitious the filmmakers were to have included various cartoon characters from different companies. The first time I saw this when I was five, I remember the scene where Eddie Valiant is falling from the sky and Mickey Mouse and Bugs Bunny start talking to them, talking to him as they're skydiving. And when I saw this, I even thought to myself, maybe I didn't know the difference between Warner Brothers and Disney, but I knew that Mickey Mouse and Bugs Bunny had never met on the big screen before. And they never did again after Who Framed Roger Rabbit. But that is one of several reasons why Who Framed Roger Rabbit is not only a great movie that still stands the test of time, but one of my top five all-time favorite films. The Western Scrub Jay. I was taking my science class on a virtual reality bird watching expedition. All of a sudden, Charlie Kane shouts, Arf! Arf! He had spotted the elusive Black Swift, a bird rarely seen in the wild. For a brief moment, Charlie had not the eyes of a nine year old boy, he had the eyes of an eagle. Teachers just have better work stories. Find out how creative teaching can be at teachdfw.org. Brought to you by Teach and the Ad Council. I love those real sick signs. They're the ones that move me. A thinly blown neurotic toe. Intensify and groove me. All this and more on our Saturdays at noon on Boston Free Radio. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host, Dan Burke, and movie critic, not to mention that. I'm so used to saying that. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. And sometimes when you're so used to saying something, you forget to say it. But just to, just to reiterate, I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. And for those of you who just tuned in, this is a special show dedicated to my top five all-time favorite movies for the given period. So just to recap. Again, this is no particular order. I'm not counting up to number one or whatever. I can't really decide what my number one favorite movie is. But I reviewed M, directed by Fritz Lang and starring Pierre Lorre. The Bridge on the River Kwai, directed by David Lean and starring William Holden and Sir Alec Guinness, amongst other people. Do the Right Thing, directed and written by Spike Lee, starring Spike Lee, Danny Aiello, John Turturro, and others. And Who Framed Roger Rabbit, directed by Robert Zemeckis and starring Bob Hoskins, Christopher Lloyd, and featuring the voice talents of Charlie Fleischer and Kathleen Turner, amongst others. Now, my number five all-time favorite movie, which I want to reiterate, it's not my all-time favorite, but it's one of them. 
The movie is Almost Famous. Now, Almost Famous, I would regard arguably as the first great movie of the 21st century. It came out on September 22, 2000, and as hard as this is to believe, this movie was actually a box office flop when it first came out. Now, unlike Who Framed Roger Rabbit and maybe The Bridge on the River Kwai, this was not considered an epic film. However, it is a movie that I think is Cameron Crowe's best, which he's written and directed so far. He hasn't made a particularly satisfying follow-up to this film, but considering the movies he's done after this have included Vanilla Sky and We Bought a Zoo, which were decent films, he still hasn't done particularly bad. Lee, or until Aloha came out. But again, I'm not faulting him for that movie. I didn't think it was as bad as other people thought it was, but we can still look back on one great movie he did, and even after a lot of good movies he did before that, like Say Anything and Jerry Maguire, and that's just the ones that Cameron Crowe has directed. But why is Almost Famous so special? Well, let me, let me first tell you the plot of the movie in case you haven't seen it. It is about a high school boy, very loosely based on Cameron Crowe himself, who's played by Patrick Fugit. In this movie, he's named William Miller. And William Miller is given the chance to write a story for Rolling Stone magazine about an up-and-coming rock band as he accompanies them on their concert tour. So the rock band in this movie is Stillwater, which is not a real band, but according to various reviews by Cameron Crowe, it's loosely based on a number of bands with whom he's toured and covered when he was actually a freelance journalist for Rolling Stone, which he actually was when he was 15 or 16 years old and had graduated prematurely from high school. So the band Stillwater is based on, in, in many parts, on Led Zeppelin, The Who, the Allman Brothers Band, and a number of other such groups. But in this movie, they are entirely fictional. And amongst the members of the band are the guitarist, Russell Hammond, who's played by Billy Crudup, and Jeff Beebe, who's played by Jason Lee. Now, Russell Hammond is very much considered the best-known member of this group, Stillwater. Very similar to Jimmy Page eclipsing the, the fame of Robert Plant in Led Zeppelin, and maybe Pete Townsend slightly eclipsing or being a little bit more famous or well-known for being in The Who than Roger Daltrey. Again, a lot of people know who Roger Daltrey and Robert Plant are, but arguably the guitarists are the bread and butter of the group. So that is definitely the case with the guitarist in this movie. And also of note is the Academy Award winning, or excuse me, Academy Award nominated supporting performance by Kate Hudson as Band-Aid, not groupie, Penny Lane. And I think very much like the other movies I reviewed for this show, Bridge on the River Kwai and Do the Right Thing in particular, there are main characters in this movie. The film centers a lot on William Miller's relationship with guitarist Russell Hammond, but there, there are even small performances in this movie that really stay with you. Even there are some scenes by, by characters that don't even have any lines or appear for about five seconds that still strangely stay with you, if only for a laugh. But what really makes this movie special is... Patrick Fugit's performance primarily. He was not nominated for an Oscar for this film. And that's really too bad because he anchored the film incredibly well. He's definitely the innocent kid amongst the debauchery, not exactly my words, of sex, drugs, and rock and roll that surround him. He's generally the only person who has a head on his shoulders, and he serves as a moral compass amongst all this craziness. But in addition to... Billy, his great scenes with Billy Crudup, in addition to great support, supporting performances by Kate Hudson and Frances McDormand, the, the performance that stayed with me the most was Philip Seymour Hoffman's performance as Lester Bangs. And unlike Stillwater and the members of the group, Lester Bangs is 
a noted rock journalist who actually did live in real life. And I think Philip Seymour Hoffman may not have done an exact impersonation of Lester Bangs, but he got the essence of Lester Bangs really well. As a matter of fact, I think Lester Bangs in real life probably reminded me more of Jack Black and High Fidelity than Philip Seymour Hoffman in this movie. But that's not to say that Philip Seymour Hoffman's performance wasn't great. It was great. In fact, I think, especially after Philip Seymour Hoffman's passing, this is the performance by Mr. Hoffman that stayed with me the most. My favorite scene with Lester Bangs is when William Miller is on the phone with Lester Bangs because Lester Bangs is his mentor. And he's talking about the difference, but Lester Bangs is talking about the difference between cool people and uncool people. And one of the, the scenes that really... <laughs> stuck with or one of the lines that stuck with me that Philip Seymour Hoffman said was yeah you can call me anytime I'm always at home I'm completely uncool now it may seem like a funny line but it also is almost an iceberg tip of Lester Bang's loneliness certainly the way Philip Seymour Hoffman portrays him in this film so I don't have very much time left which is the downside of doing a show like this but if I made it the three hours that I wanted to make it I wouldn't be able to get get as much as I could with it almost famous is more than just a soundtrack it's one of my all-time favorite movies a ranger station. I'd like to report a bear hug. Okay. I put out my campfire and Smokey Bear hugged me. So you drowned the fire, you stirred it, drowned it again, and felt that it was cold? Uh-huh. Yeah, but he's just letting you know you did good. Bear hug from Smokey Bear. Status update. I'm gonna let you go now. There are many ways to start a fire, but one sure way to put it out. Learn how you can do your part at SmokeyBear.com. Sponsored by the U.S. Forest Service Ad Council and your state forester. Every Tuesday at 3, something special happens on Boston Free Radio. Why, it's Toppers with your host, Gil. Toppers, spinning the tunes that today's youth demand. From Justin Bieber to Lady Gaga to the Fleetwoods. And, on occasion, Hoagie Carmichael. If you missed the program, you can check out the archives at Toppers Radio. That's one word, dot blogspot, dot C-O-M. Toppers. Welcome back to Words on Film on Boston Free Radio. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke, and Words on Film is the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. So I told you guys in the very beginning of the show that the reason I did a retrospective of my all-time favorite movies is because I didn't get to see any new movies for circumstances beyond my control. However, I've got to say that even though I don't review many old movies on this show, I actually did have a lot of fun doing it for this show, and I might do it at a later date. I wouldn't, I probably won't do it every single week, but I really did have a lot of fun. So thank you guys so much for tuning in. Thanks to my Facebook viewers for their great input. I. I gotta say, this this has been a lot of fun, and I seriously considered even canceling this show for this week because I didn't have any new movies to review. But now I don't have to do that. So thank you guys so much for tuning in. I had an amazing time hosting this show for you. But, of course, the show is not over yet because I've got my next segment, which is what's coming out next. These, this is a spoken word preview of movies that are coming out. And I usually give you my point of view as to what this movie may or may not be like, but I'm not encouraging or discouraging you from seeing these movies. I'm just giving you what I think of this movie, or what I'm going to think of this movie, maybe what expectations I have, and whether or not I'm going to see it. So, without any further ado, here's what's coming out next. Coming this weekend of September 22nd, the big movie that's coming out is Kingsman the Golden Circle. This is the sequel to 2014's Kingsman the Secret Service, which was, I thought, a really good mashup between James, Bl James Bond excuse me, and Men in Black. I thought this movie worked incredibly well. Taron Edgerton was a good lead. I thought Colin Firth probably had one of his best performances ever, and that's coming from a long line of great performances. But joining 
um, Taron Edgerton and Colin Firth in this movie are actually a number of actors you wouldn't expect to be in a movie about this British Secret Service by any other name. Uh, particularly American actors, including Channing Tatum, Julianne Moore, Halle Berry, and Jeff Bridges. They're all in this film. So, the plot of Kingsman the Golden Circle. When their headquarters are destroyed and their world is held hostage, the Kingsman journey leads them to the discovery of an allied spy organization in the U.S., probably hence the other American actors in this film. These two elite secret organizations must band together to defeat a common enemy. So this is really interesting. It's a British Secret Service teaming up with an American Secret Service. And I think they're probably going to do this better than in a film that came out two years ago, which I wasn't particularly impressed with. It was a movie, the name I forgot, but it starred Army Hammer and Henry Cavill. And it was about U.S. and Russian spies banding together. It was based on, oh, The Man from U.N.C.L.E., the, that movie. It was based on the TV show of the same name. I wasn't particularly impressed by that, but I think Kingsman the Golden Circle will do better, I think. But I have to see it to make sure. And this is a movie I guarantee you I will see for next show. And when I see it, I will let you know what I think. Another movie that's coming out, which I probably will see, is the Lego Ninjago movie. So this is the third Lego movie that's been made, and the second to feature a popular franchise, particularly in the Lego world. So, for those of you who don't know what Ninjago is, or the plot of this movie, I will tell you right now. The movie is about six young ninjas whose names are Lloyd, Jay, Kai, Cole, Zane, and Nia, who are tasked with defending their island home called Ninjago. By night, they're gifted warriors using their skills and awesome fleet of vehicles to fight villains and monsters. By day, they're ordinary teens struggling against the greatest enemy, high school. So the movie features the voices of Jackie Chan, which seems appropriate, Dave Franco, Fred Armisen and Kumail Nanjiani, who you might remember from the m movie that was out in theaters recently and is coming out in on DVD now, and I forgot the name of it. But it was r a really good movie, one of the best of the summer, even though I can't remember the name of it, and it's going to take me a while to... Uh, let me just look it up, because I, I feel like I'm being so unprofessional. The Big Sick! I knew it had the word big in it. So, the movie The Big Sick. But anyway, the Lego Ninjago movie, I, I've been impressed by both Lego movies that have come out so far. I can't wait for the sequel to the, the, the big Lego movie, which I think will be coming out eventually. But the, the Lego Ninjago movie looks interesting. Can't say whether it's good or not, but I will see it, and I'll let you know what I think for next week's show. And what do you know? That's the end of the program, uh, Words on Film. So just a reminder that the views and opinions expressed on this show about movies or otherwise are solely those of yours truly, your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. They do not necessarily reflect the respective views of any individual employees of the station airing this broadcast or the station as a whole. With that said, I'm Dan Burke saying I'll see you at the movies.